Thanks everyone for joining today. We'll get started in just a few minutes as the uh, attendees join the, the Zoom webinar here. Looking forward to the discussion. All right, I think we have a quorum uh, in in the attendees, so we'll get we'll get started today with this panel from the Center for Climate and Security on building climate resilience abroad. My name is Erin Sikorsky. I am the deputy director of the Center for Climate and Security, and I'm really glad that so many of you are joining us today for this important discussion on how the United States can best support its allies and partners in managing climate security risks. Uh, this is the third panel in our series on our climate security plan for America, which is a plan we released in December or excuse me in, in 2019. Uh, demonstrating how the US government could uh, lead on climate security across a variety of areas. So the first panel in December discussed the importance of leadership. The second panel in February discussed the role of intelligence and assessment in understanding climate risk and videos from both of those events are available on our website in case you missed them. Today's event will also be recorded and is, is on the record. And so today what we're going to talk about is how to take that ambitious climate leadership we identified in December and that better approach to climate security assessments we talked about in February, how to take those two things into the realm of action in foreign policy. How can the United States help other countries better prepare for climate security risks that the world has already bought, the ones we know are coming even if we cut all emissions tomorrow? At the same time, what action can we also take to help allies and partners prevent catastrophic security risks in the second half of the century if we don't decarbonize now. Why are these actions not only the right thing to do, but why are they also critical to US national security interests? And of course, the timing for today's event couldn't be more perfect. Just on Friday, we saw the Biden administration announce its agenda for the 22 April Earth Day Summit and the 40 countries on the virtual invitation list. In addition to the expected focus on emissions targets, the announcement highlighted that the key summit themes will include a discussion on strengthening capacity to protect lives and livelihoods from the impacts of climate change and to address the global security challenges posed by climate change and the impact on readiness. Those on the invite list to the summit include leaders of countries that are already acutely facing the security effects of climate change. So to dig into the questions I posed during my introduction here and share perspectives on different regions of the world, we really have an all-star panel with us today and I'm excited uh, to, to introduce them all. And I'm excited to hear from them. They've all worked in government and academia at think tanks and on the ground. So they bring a variety of perspectives to this discussion. And what I'm going to do is introduce each of them briefly and then turn to them in order for some opening remarks. And then we will have a question and answer period uh, with the audience here. So think of, think of your questions as, as you go and feel free to type them into the Q&A box, which we'll use for selecting the questions. Uh, my colleague Evan Barnard will be assisting with technical details today. So if you have a question as we go along or something's not working for you, feel free to ping him in Zoom. Uh, he'll also be posting relevant articles and discussion items in the chat box as we go. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce all four panelists and then, then we'll get started. Uh, our first panelist will be Dr. Tegan Blaine, the Senior Advisor on Environment and Conflict at the US Institute of Peace. Prior to joining USIP in 2020, she served as a vice president on a climate change initiative at the National Geographic Society. She's also led the climate change team in USAID's Bureau for Africa for over a decade, where she developed USAID's strategy and investment plan for its climate change work in Africa and built and led a team that provided thought leadership and technical support to USAID's Africa missions. Before working at USAID, 
Blaine worked on climate change and international development at McKinsey and Company and served as a policy advisor on water at the US Department of State. She'll be followed by Sherry Goodman, the senior strategist and advisory board member at the Center for Climate and Security, also the chair of the board at the Council on Strategic Risks, which is our, our overarching home, agent, uh, home organization. She's secretary general of the International Military Council on Climate Security and a senior fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center's Polar Institute and Environmental Change and Security Program. Sherry served as the president and CEO of the Consortium for Ocean Leadership, and earlier she served as senior vice president and general counsel of the Center for Naval Analyses, where she was also the founder and executive director of the CNA Military Advisory Board. And of course, Sherry served as the first Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Environmental Security as well. And we're always pleased to have her join our conversations. Sherry will be followed by Dr. Marcus King, who's also a senior fellow and member of the advisory board at the Center for Climate and Security. He has extensive experience working on climate change and energy issues in academia, policy research organizations, and the US government. Dr. King is John O. Rankin Associate Professor and Director of the Master of Arts in International Affairs Program at GW, it's Elliott School of International Affairs. King's teaching and academic research focus on the field of environmental security. He actually has a new book out on water security, which I'm sure he'll be talking about um, some today. He was Project Director for the CNA Military Advisory Board and held appointments in the Office of the Secretary of Defense and the Office of the Secretary of Energy. And bringing home our panel today will be uh, Sarang Shador, who is a senior fellow with the Council on Strategic Risks. He's also a senior research analyst at the Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin and a consultant. His area of focus is geopolitical risk and its intersection with the global energy transition and climate change. He has experience in security studies, international relations and long range forecasting with a special emphasis on South Asia. He's worked and collaborated with think tanks, governments, and political risk firms in multiple countries, including Stratfor, Oxford Analytica, the UK military, Ministry of Defense, the Stimson Center, and the Indian Ministry of External Affairs. So as you can see, we've got quite, quite the crew. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Tegan uh, to, to kick us off. Thank you so much, Erin. And thank you all for participating in this seminar. Um, Erin laid out a few questions for all of us that she asked us to address. And I in person, or I in particular, will be speaking from my past experience working at USAID on climate change issues in Africa, and now from the perspective of the US Institute of Peace. I am so thrilled that adaptation and resilience is going to be part of the US, uh, the Leaders Summit on climate change in the next few weeks. In my opinion, beginning to partner better on climate resilience and adaptation is going to be an absolutely critical part of re-engaging partners and rebuilding the legitimacy of US leadership on climate change. The world has fundamentally shifted over the last few years as we increasingly recognize that more extreme events and other climate change, other climate trends that we're seeing right now are not just in the future, they're affecting lives at this moment. It really ups the ante for the US to be widening its partners and coalitions by engaging more fully on adaptation and resilience. The US always has engaged in these issues, but it has generally been less of a focus on the mitigation side of the agenda. And I think now, especially with the United States re-entering the Paris Agreement, it's going to be critical to bring more attention to these topics as a way to start building partnerships that haven't existed before and really increase the number of countries that the US is working with as it rebuilds its leadership in this space. I also think that if we can effectively lead on climate change, this influence is likely to spill over into many other diplomatic areas and help build positive relationships with a range of countries. So I'm really thrilled in, in just the announcement from Friday. Now, in my mind, I see a few issues where climate stability or I see a few areas where climate and stability issues really do have ramifications for the United States. 
unlike Europe, we're not likely to be a target for immigration from Africa. Um, however, I do see that there is a very real possibility for demand for peacekeeping forces and humanitarian aid, both of which have the potential to exact a significant financial toll and potentially a human toll as well. But what interests me most, quite honestly, is how the US should respond to these climate and security issues, especially in Africa. And there are a few things that I'd like to highlight. The first thing is something that emerged from a 2018 analysis by USAID on climate and fragility. The authors found that state legitimacy is generally weak in countries that are facing compounded fragility and climate risks. This lack of state legitimacy contributed more to fragility than the efficiency by which an environment provided services and met its citizens' needs. So it was really the trust in the government, the trust in how the government was set up that was absolutely critical. To me, this provides a real opportunity for how the US government can engage on climate and fragility issues basically by working as early as possible to strengthen state legitimacy in the eyes of citizens. And that can contribute in many ways to tackling some of the bigger challenges later on. But there are a couple of other kind of issues or entry points uh, that I also think are really worth thinking about at this stage. Firstly, I'm increasingly concerned that we ignore cities at our peril. Evidence suggests that people are being pushed towards cities due to the risks in rural areas, whether it's risks, direct, direct risks of conflict, whether it's, it's food or water insecurity, which is being exacerbated by population growth and climate change, among other, other issues. But that's a very different situation than when people are pulled to cities because of economic opportunities. That push to cities is a much more challenging and must, much less positive situation to be dealing with. And in Africa, drier conditions are linked to the growth of cities. So it's likely that climate change is exacerbating this trend, especially in arid countries. And it really means that people are moving to cities because they, there's something unsustainable about their lives in the countryside. African cities are growing fast. And many of the biggest cities are also located along coasts and have multiple exposures to climate change. Sea level rise, increasing salinity in the waters and in the soils, risks of floods, many other issues that are likely to impact the most vulnerable, especially those who are in formal settlements. I would expect that these kinds of impacts are going to drive the inequalities and the kind of socioeconomic marginalization that migrants faced. And just as we look at the stability and legitimacy of state governments, I also think that we need to be looking at the stability and legitimacy of city governments. The, the fact that climate change and other environmental risks are going to exacerbate resentments and frustrations, especially among all these migrants who are beginning to enter, not beginning, are entering cities, could really drive conflict in urban areas and potentially even spill over to destabilize countries. In the past, USAID did not necessarily prioritize work on cities. And increasingly going forward, I really do think that we need to address the issues of these urban areas and not just think about how climate change is affecting security issues at the country level, but really start thinking about these subnational issues as well. But I'd also like to highlight the role of regional organizations and regional efforts and how we as the US government, well, not me any longer, I'm no longer part of the US government, but how the US government can better support those initiatives. Neighboring countries often have similar exposure to climate change and are dealing with similar risks. For example, you're not going to get a drought in just one West African country. Many of them are likely to be dealing with a drought all at the same time. 
and may be dealing with very similar issues when it comes to the security side of the agenda, whether that's issues with armed groups or ethnic militias or other issues there. Smaller countries also have less capacity to respond to diverse challenges. It's possible that regional cooperation around opportunities to consolidate systems against uh, or around providing climate and weather services, for example, to increase disease surveillance and prediction across an entire region rather than by country country, and supporting harmonized networks and policy frameworks are something that regional institutions could lead and could actually be stronger because they're not done at the bilateral level, but are done at the regional level with access to wider amounts of data, with larger predictive capacities because they're done at that level. But I also think that this kind of cooperation between countries in a region increases opportunities for countries to support each other. National level institutions will absolutely continue to play a critical role in addressing climate and security challenges. But I really do think that regional institutions can fill in capacity gaps. They can streamline provision of science and technology services and increase cooperation within a region could also help increase the perception of legitimacy of the individual country governments. There are ways for us to strengthen regional organizations more than we have and to work with them closely as real partners, especially as they build their partnerships with all of the countries within a given region. You know, whether it's working through economic unions, whether it's working through the African Union, et cetera, these regional institutions are important politically, important technically, and they are at a, at a unique place for helping countries across an entire region take on shared issues. You know, state and USAID have very different cultures and very different ways that they approach partnerships and working with different countries. And I do think that there are countless ways for state and USAID in particular to strengthen their work together in order to avoid the need for military or humanitarian engagement down the line. USAID has a critical role to play in addressing both state stability and climate risks from the regional to the subnational level. And it draws on a long history of experience and engagement with individual countries. State has incredible diplomatic opportunities to engage on similar issues. Initially through the UNFCCC process and the Paris Agreement, including support for the Green Climate Fund, but also by genuinely seeking to develop wider and more substantive political partnerships on adaptation and resilience issues than in the past. And I do think that's going to be an incredibly important piece to the United States re-engaging in the Paris Agreement. So with that, I'll stop and I look forward to the contributions of other speakers. Thank you so much. I'm really glad you brought up this issue of both subnational and then regional groupings and making sure we're thinking through all the actors we need to engage. Um, that's, that's a really important part of the conversation. Uh, all right, now we'll turn it over to, to Sherry Goodman. Great, well, thank you. Um, thank you so much. It's really a pleasure. Um, to be here with everyone. And I think it's really perfect um, uh, that we started with Tegan today because I really think the future um, of how we need to think about uh, climate security engagement with allies and partners um, will be led by our diplomatic and development agencies. And I think that's very important for those of us who have like me spent many years in defense uh, and I still see an important role for defense, but I really want to underscore how important it is in this age, in this era, um, to be in a supporting and supportive role because most of the solutions we're talking about, whether it's mitigation or climate resilience, are not what we like to call the kinetic solutions. There's a lot that defense can offer, and it's a great partner, and it's got great depth of capabilities. 
And I think that as we think about how to secure, make more secure our future, I make more climate resilient our future, we need to be thinking about the, the important points that Tegan laid out. Um, so, you know, I, I want to thank, thank everyone for joining today and really congratulate um, the great team at the Center for Climate Security uh, and the work that's been done on the Climate Security Plan for America that really, and many other documents through CCS, CNA, and many others over the years that laid the groundwork for the very ambitious uh, climate and security agenda in President Biden's executive orders uh, and so many people who contributed to that and are moving that forward. Uh, and the nice piece that Aaron laid out um, today on uh, allied engagement. And, you know, we going, so starting with that, you know, demonstrating international leadership through ambitious regional engagement. And Tegan has already talked about some of that, particularly uh, at the regional level and in, and in Africa. I, I want to note that I think there are opportunities for the defense community here to really help support that uh, by deepening its expertise in uh, climate security uh, engagement and advising. I think that all of our combatant commands should have integrate climate security across their uh, regional planning efforts. They should have dedicated climate advisors and not just in the J4 uh, where we've usually done logistics and environment, but they really need to be part of the whole um, kind of strategic thinking of the command and integrated with those increasingly, we see USAID advisors, NOAA advisors, and I think that is what's going to get us this whole of government approach that we are aspiring to, because it's not simply in Washington that it will happen, but it has to happen and be reflected at every, uh, at every regional level. Uh, so I think that's, uh, that's an important way uh, and to see it reflected in all these major dialogues that the president has already undertaken, whether it's the quadrilateral or whether in NATO, uh, Secretary uh, Blinken, who was there recently, these are all going to be important regional engagements. And as we look at um, addressing climate-driven fragility and conflict, and as Tegan so aptly noted, you know, so much of the fragility we've seen in states around the world under is underlaid by climate fragility, drought, desertification, flooding, extreme weather events, the unpredictability of the future, the instability caused by climate change. Um, and that needs to be reflected then in all of our strategies. And I, I'm pleased to see that there have been uh, efforts undertaken already across um, the national security community in the US led in DOD by a, a nascent effort called RECESS to help understand the environmental security efforts to support the Global Fragility Act in particular. And I think we'll see more of those efforts. And I'd like to see those types of uh, engagements, uh, both DOD wide and interagency lifted up so that we get, we get back to thinking about this in a whole, uh, in a whole of government way. Um, and as we look to engage our allies and partners on climate resilience, we can build this back better, build back better into our, uh, a whole range of engagements we have. Now in, in the defense community in the 1990s, we had a very robust set of mill-to-mill -mill environmental engagements, environmental security cooperation among combatant commands, and there are a variety of tools uh, that are still available in authorities that can be revitalized to enable this through the Defense Environmental International Cooperation Program, other defense security assistance programs. They can make real this ambition. And I'm very hopeful um, that both uh, the federal, that, aid, that the federal agencies today supported by Congress as necessary through appropriate legislative action will undertake to advance these defense security assistance programs where they support climate resilience uh, and climate security. Uh, and I think there's much that can be done there. As, and then as we build, uh, you know, the executive order calls specifically for conducting collaborative war gaming and analytic efforts and exercises. 
And I think that needs to be done now at a variety of levels. Uh, certainly, it's, uh, you know, war gaming is done at an operational level by all the commands and all the services for a variety of needs. But we need to undertake this in new and different ways, uh, in ways that involve uh, probably a whole of government approach within the US that's done with our allies and partners in, region, in regional forums, whether it's NATO, whether it's ASEAN, um, whether it's, um, you know, the Arctic Council, for example, does already does exercises with the Arctic Coast through the Arctic Coast Guard Forum on search and rescue uh, or oil spill um, conditions in the Arctic. We're going to need to expand some of those scenario based exercises at various levels in various regions to allow for improved foresight and planning, uh, allowing us to improve our predictive capabilities so that we can reach a world of climate domain awareness. We are on the cusp of being able to have those capabilities um, as our forecasting, our foresight uh, improve, as our predictive capabilities through AI and other techniques enable us to go to sort of extended weather, seasonal, subseasonal forecast to make more robust the planning scenarios that we can use at local and regional levels to better understand what that future might look like. Too many people who are not experts like us spending much of our days that don't can't envision uh, what a climate insecure future would look like. But some of us have had the privilege of participating in these games, um, you know, in war games and scenarios in the past where we look at, at how a combination of drought and food insecurity is going to dramatically drive migration, even across our own borders here in the US. And we need to really uh, have the, the uh, foreign policy development and national security community as a whole come together and look at that. And some think tanks have started to do that. I think that needs to be done within the government as well um, to improve our planning and our processes. Um, and finally, I would, um, I want to, I want to close by sort of saying that I think that uh, the beginnings of the, the NATO, the new NATO strategic concept and framework that looks at climate security really is doing, is really trying to lead in this area. And I think that, you know, among the organizations that I know, uh, that's going to be a good model. Uh, it's building climate domain, it aspires to climate domain awareness, climate resilience uh, with infrastructure and energy systems. And we know we need to do that within our own country uh, as we look at our own sort of military bases, our infrastructure, our energy systems. But we're going to have to do it with allies and partners around the world, whether it's in NATO, the Arctic Council, ASEAN, other regional organizations in the Caribbean. Uh, and in the Pacific Island nations. We need to do that because that's how we're going to return to American leadership humbly and in service of our partners because they need us to help them respond to uh, natural disasters increasingly climate driven. And then finally, I think we can lead by example as we get our own house in order, uh, as we make our uh, infrastructure more resilient, as we move to a lower carbon energy systems as we use the power of our innovation, technology, our entrepreneurship uh, in America to help usher in the next generation and the next era of uh, green energy and climate technologies that will help us secure a better future for our children and our grandchildren. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Sherry, for providing that, that broad picture and also the reminder that, that DOD has a key role to play, but it's not the only, only actor and perhaps shouldn't be the primary actor in response uh, to some of these resilience challenges. Uh, Dr. King, over to you. Thank you so much, Aaron, for the opportunity to be here. Um, I've always found that one of my most difficult challenges is following Sherry Goodman on any panel. Um, just because her remarks are so comprehensive and salient. So I would say maybe everything's been said, but not everyone has said it. Um, so I'll just try to hit some of the, the key points. Um, you know, I'm an academic now. And so what I really look at is water stress. And the reason that I do that is because I believe it's the most visceral and immediate effect of climate change in many parts of the world, you know, not everywhere. 
Um, and so I look at the um, Middle East and North Africa, the MENA region, you know, a region that's been primarily um, reliant on agriculture for employment, uh, has seen increasingly low crop yields, um, and then migration from rural to urban areas. And I want to flesh that out a bit more. Um, and, and the countries of the Middle East and North Africa have been largely resilient thus far to these effects of drought, except in areas that are already war zones or areas that are already unstable. So for example, Yemen um, or the Horn of Africa will begin to see effects where a country, where governments will have less ability to meet the basic needs of the people. Um, but then speaking of, of war games, um, I went, um, last November, I joined a team from Foreign Policy Magazine Analytics um, for a scenario exercise in Abu Dhabi at the Emirates Diplomatic Academy. And what we did was we played out a scenario of Egypt in 2030 that was hit by a confluence of these um, aforementioned climate impacts that I've talked about, which are salinization um, of the soil, high temperatures, sea level rise in the Delta zone um, where most of the agriculture is based. Um, and what we found um, when we were trying to react to this unfolding scenario was that there were truly no good options for the resulting environmental migration. So whether that be Southern Europe, whether it had been um, maybe moving toward Israel, there were just basically no good options. And what we found also was that regional organizations, um, such as the Gulf Cooperation Council, um, just didn't have a framework to um, react to regional migration. Um, and so we, what do we do about the connections between instability within states and then climate driven migration, which might, you know, especially be in areas that, that are that experience a drought. So another area most more close to home is the dry corridor of Central America um, and some of the fragility we find within the states there. And so these issues um, have result have been a result of a prolonged drought from 2014 to 2017 in the area. Um, and what we've seen there is that um, there's a prolonged drought. There's also, um, um, there's also the, the fact that there's been storms there, severe storms. So indigenous and subsistence farmers, again, have moved from rural to urban areas and the urban areas are very violent. So this is just one of the things that has sparked migration um, from the dry corridor to the United States. And so um, what I wanted to do then was talk a little bit about how I believe that climate migration, it has received a little less attention in the security debate than some of the other issues. So the first executive order by um, the Biden administration tasked all agencies to engage in a extensive international framework and exploration to see how the United States could engage both diplomatically and in the development sector with international partners. Um, but there was a second executive order that came out around the same time on rebuilding and enhancing programs to resettle refugees and planning for the impacts of climate migration. And so within that, the president tasked agencies this time they have 180 days, it was 90 in the other executive order, um, to report on the international security implications of climate re related migration and also options for protection and resettlement of refugees. Um, interestingly, it also, uh, you know, as an academic, it, it asked to identify mechanisms for identifying who climate migrants are. So I think that's really the key. Um, and then what are some of the answers? Um, I think the answers, as Sherry had alluded to, are really in the area of development, um, trying to make countries um, a little more resilient with the opportunities to work collaboratively with other organizations, so international organizations, NGOs, and then of course the people on the ground there. Um, so there was an excellent report by um, Amali Tower of Climate Refugees um, called Climate Change Forced Displacement in the Biden Administration and actions the Biden Administration can take to ensure rights. And so the report noted that globally there were 33 million displaced refugees in 2019, but of that 33 million, 25 million were displaced by the result of disasters, often climate-related disasters. And so an approach to this is 
really looking at the security of people and communities, um, maybe rather than the security of states, um, and recognizing that there's still a lack of global governance to address many of the disruptive effects of, of climate migration, and that there's always been a sort of a blurry line between voluntary and forced migration. So what can the US do in, in this context? Um, so I have some international um, prescriptions here. So I think the Biden administration could align the national climate plans that are, are being developed um, to work more with the UN Security Council and other UN agencies. Um, there was a resolution called 2349, which recognized climate migration as having a profound effect on the security of the Lake Chad region in, in Northern Nigeria. Um, there's also been a call for a special UN representative on climate security. Um, and so the United States, I believe, should support that. Also, the Climate and Security Plan for America, issued by the Center for Climate Security, also called for a climate watch center in the UN. So I think that would be a, another appropriate um, way to approach this. And so um, another example is the UN Group of Friends on Climate and Security, which was started by Germany in a small island state, Nauru, which is facing an existential threat from climate change. Um, and, you know, and finally, within the UN system, um, there is the loss and damage mechanism, which was also known as Article 8 in the Paris Accord. Um, and what that does is it mobilizes more climate finance around adaptation, you know, because the UNFCCC framework has really been focused more on mitigation. Um, and so I hope that the loss and damage mechanisms will continue to get more um, traction, especially as it affects, has the existential effects on small island states, in that the United States can support the loss and damage mechanisms in the upcoming negotiations at the summit in Glasgow later this year. So that, that's all I have. <laughs> Great, thanks Marcus for both the, the water security and then the climate migration uh, conversation. I think that's so so important. One of the critical uh, issues we need to, it needs more discussion and examination. All right, uh, over to you, Sarang. Thank you, Erin, and, and I'm so glad to be here among such a distinguished panel today uh, and speak a little bit about uh, how the U.S. might look at South Asia, which is, of course, a massive part of the world in terms of population, complexity of uh, uh, the number of countries, and also the various challenges in the region uh, at various levels uh, and, and, and scales. So I have a few slides, actually, I'd like to share. So I'm going to try and make this work in just a second. Oh, I see. I, I think I cannot uh, screen share, it appears. Uh, you have a green button at the bottom of your screen? Yes, but it says host disabled. Screen. Oh, <laughs> yeah. well, there you go. That's, there you go. Now you can't. You should be able to now. No, I can't. Okay, let's see. Right. Let's, uh, let's do this. So everybody should be able to see uh, the title slide. If, uh, if you cannot, let me know. Is that visible? Yep, we can see it. Okay, awesome. So uh, what are we going to talk about when it comes to South Asia? Well, the, we only have 10 minutes here for, for our opening remarks. I'm going to try and be, try and make it uh, Short, uh, the first thing I would do is point to two recent reports that were uh, released by the International Military Council on Climate and Security Expert Group, in which uh, CCS and CSR played a major role. Uh, and these are on South Asia, which is the topic of today, but also there's a companion report on Southeast Asia. So I would very much point all of you to those reports to uh, in indeed contain some of the points I'm going to talk about today in, in some greater detail. Um, now, South Asia is a vast uh, region uh, with a population of more than one and a half billion people. And uh, there was a very interesting study a couple of years back from the International Water Management Institute. And I wanted to just share this map 
of South Asia with the climate vulnerability regions shaded in terms of uh, how severe or moderate the challenge might be. So the darker shades are, are more challenging, the lighter shades tend to be less challenging. And this is, this is a map uh, comprised more uh, combining agriculture and adapt, uh, agricultural uh, vulnerability and adaptive uh, capability. So it doesn't include every single variable that we might imagine under the rubric of climate security, but it's a good, it's a good uh, proxy for what we're gonna talk about. You can see that most of the region has fairly substantial challenges, including on the coasts, the, the, the peninsula, as well as uh, in the Eastern and Western extremities of, of, the, country, of the region. So uh, we have a region that's uh, very sensitive to climate change, quite vulnerable, and uh, also facing other uh, challenges uh, to do with raising living standards, solving uh, issues of governance, and indeed interstate relations. Now, what are US national security interests in this whole mix? Well, actually, given the size of the region and its centrality uh, to the Indo-Pacific, uh, they really span the entire spectrum. So the US has an interest in ensuring, of course, human security, that there is the least loss of life, livelihoods, uh, and so forth. It also has an interest in maintaining regional security, which is uh, to support uh, positive regional outcomes of stability, uh, and of course, keeping in mind uh, the many sensitivities that exist uh, in the region. Now, the Biden administration can take a number of actions in this space, and I would, I would not repeat all the excellent points made by my previous speakers in the panel on uh, uh, leading with diplomacy, uh, developmental uh, approaches, as well as uh, uh, weighing, uh, giving importance to regional organizations. But uh, just threw up a few points here, which I think are relevant to our uh, discussion today. Uh, I think we have to start with human security, which is essentially the challenge of uh, many hundreds of millions of uh, citizens that are facing very adverse uh, climate impacts, uh, even as we speak uh, with the recent uh, floods in Karachi in Pakistan that you might have followed last year, as well as Cyclone Amphan in Bangladesh that caused significant migration. Uh, there are challenges of all kinds. And one of the most important ones is that of agriculture. A very large portion of South Asia depends on agriculture for livelihood. So climate proofing agriculture is one of the key uh, human security challenges as we move forward. There's also the question of water stress that are very large portions of the region that are highly water stressed due to a combination of reasons, uh, but it's really particularly acute in Northwestern India and in Pakistan, and also in some parts of Central India. And this is where uh, water conservation becomes a topic of potential collaboration. There's also coastal challenges with cyclones and sea level rise. Some of the biggest cities in the world are located in South Asia, such as Mumbai and Karachi, and urban planning which was stressed by a previous speaker, I would uh, absolutely agree that that is an area of, of, of major uh, of concern and indeed collaboration. The US itself has uh, some of these challenges. So this is not a one-way situation where the US has all the answers, uh, but indeed a collaborative uh, situation where South Asia is facing some of the, let's say some of the challenges that maybe the US or parts of the US might face in the future. Uh, so uh, and then there's also, uh, challenges of regional security, which are primarily difficult relations between states in the region, India and Pakistan, of course, but also in India and China, that's uh, more recently been in the news. Now, these are relations that are best handled by the states in question. The US can only play a supportive role in terms of uh, providing assistance if, should it be, uh, should it be requested. Uh, in terms of uh, leveraging its partnerships with South Asian states to uh, help ease some of these challenges of transboundary river, uh, water uh, sharing, and uh, some of the stress that is on existing water treaties and so forth. Uh, there are also a number of other areas where the Biden administration can, uh, can play a role. Mitigation, of course, has been a major area of focus. 
There's been a lot of leadership in the region itself on mitigation with India's very aggressive solar targets that it has uh, substantially achieved so far and continuing shift to solar and other forms of renewable energy that are taking place in the region overall. Bangladesh recently turned away from a coal plant plan that it had on, on, on its uh, radar. And um, so a, a number of positive actions are happening on mitigation in the region. Obviously more can happen, uh, but that's an area where I think the US is well positioned to play a collaborative role. Um, and then finally, I would just point to one major success in the past that actually worked uh, in terms of uh, an international organization where the US was significantly involved, which is the World Bank playing a significant role in the Indus Water Treaty of 1960. And that treaty has survived the test of time and survived many wars because it was well designed at the outset. Although, of course, the new challenges of climate change uh, means that it needs to be probably uh, reconsidered uh, and re-looked at by the parties involved. Uh, and the US again can play a supportive role if, uh, should it, should it uh, be requested by, by the, the, the states in, in the region. So, so those are the sort of uh, highlight actions, I would say. Uh, we can come back to some of this in the Q&A because there's quite a, quite a menu there of, of actions that have been taken. Finally, I'm just gonna uh, touch a little bit on the mitigation question because South Asia is, uh, contributes 10% of current greenhouse gas emissions, and that fraction is going to grow as two economies in particular are growth economies. And I should say a third one as well, but it's a much smaller one. So India, of course, is, is, is a large country in the region with, with a very high footprint uh, of both GDP and uh, emissions relative to the other countries. But it's also Bangladesh, which is now entering, uh, essentially leaving the uh, least developed countries category and moving into the middle income countries by the middle of this decade. Uh, its growth has been very strong and there's also been a very good uh, performance of human development. So that is a good thing, uh, but also means that Bangladesh, uh, Bangladesh's uh, uh, emissions footprints are growing. Uh, uh, they're still small, but uh, they will grow in the future. So that's an area where um, India, Bangladesh, as well as Pakistan and Sri Lanka would be uh, significant contributors to emissions down the road and, and uh, the US can uh, play a role in, in encouraging uh, this uh, shift to renewable energy. So with these brief uh, kind of flyby over all of these complex topics, I'm gonna stop and uh, we can address any, any detailed questions in the, in the Q&A. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Sarang, and thanks for having some slides for us to help walk us through that. You know, you used a word that many panelists use, which was collaboration. And I think that is an underlying theme to this conversation is the need for the United States to approach this in a humble manner, if you will, going forward, especially given actions over the past few years, but also that the successful interventions will be those that have local buy-in and support and will help us um, best understand how to approach. We have, we have some questions in the Q&A, but I am gonna take moderator's privilege to ask the first question to you all. And recognizing that the Biden administration's kind of initial skinny budget request should be coming soon here, either later this week or next, you know, what would you be looking for in that request as a signal that the administration is uh, say focused on um, this resilience and adaptation issue. You know, what kinds of things would you like to see either, you know, for a state or DOD or USAID or elsewhere um, to indicate that, that this is part of the, the conversation going forward? <laughs> Who wants to jump in on that one? Go ahead, Marcus. Okay. I'll follow you. I wasn't trying to raise my hand. Uh, I'm electronically here. Um, you know, so as an academic, I think one thing that is important really is to have a climate um, security research agenda. So seeing money behind research, um, I think would be really important. 
um, and something that has been overlooked and, and needs regeneration, you know, obviously are the science agencies. Um, so, um, you know, the United States has unprecedented foresight capabilities. Um, the United States has um, Earth observation platforms, um, some of the, the agencies like NOAA um, with weather forecasting tools, big data sets, the ability to do more modeling if possible. So, I, you know, I'd like to see more research into predictive tools that could be used, especially by civilian agencies um, and, and this gets a little bit into diplomacy as well, um, and that some of this information can be shared um, with our allies and other um, fragile states. So putting together mechanisms for research, um, technology development, and technology sharing are all areas I would look for in, in new appropriations bills. Thanks, Marcus. Sherry? Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with all that. We need to up our game on um, climate security research and science in the Earth Systems Arena, NOAA, NASA, NSF, the other domestic uh, science agencies. We need to provide better support for the convergence between the social science and the physical science research. That some of that convergence research started a few years ago for coupled human natural systems, but some of it was less well funded in recent years. We need to go back to that. We need to look at how the Earth system's predictive capabilities can be utilized um, to support some of these uh, contingency efforts and sort of uh, more uh, look at the at the planning, not just sort of daily operational planning, but opportunities to use it. Uh, for like in the combatant commanders initiative funds that needs to be revitalized. I'm seeing that Bob Barnes asked about the title uh, 22 and title 10 security assistance programs. And I do agree that we should revise and update those programs and authorities to in clearly encompass um, assistance um, for um, uh, you know, for it clearly encompass climate security and climate resilience in those programs. The Global Security Contingency Fund, the Section 33 U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Interagency and International Support Authority. Uh, there are some others, Forces uh, Train and Equip Authority. Uh, I mentioned already DIEC, but a number of those I think are um, very important and have opportunities to help us as well uh, in an interagency process um, with good partners uh, with state USAID and the other uh, civilian agencies. Great, thanks. Anyone else wanna jump in on this or should we move on to the other questions? Tegan, go ahead. I might add to what everybody else has said, all of which are really important things. Um, I would probably also look for specific climate change budgets related to adaptation and resilience and what countries or what regions those are being designated for. For example, in the past, uh, the climate change adaptation budget primarily went to countries that were a bit more stable to be frank. And um, it meant that it was very difficult to talk to deal with some of these conflict and climate change issues in countries that are most at risk for those complicating influences. There's a lot of work to integrate climate change into various kinds of work, including integrating climate change into security and conflict work. But unless there's money to back it up, it often doesn't happen. And so the location of those budgets and having these kinds of issues be in a budget request are actually critical for staff who are on the ground to feel as though they are enabled to move forward. Excellent, excellent point. Sarang, did you have anything or would, should we move on? Maybe I just make a point adding to the speakers uh, on the scientific collaboration because one of the challenges in South Asia is understanding the monsoon. And there's excellent uh, scientific manpower in the region, especially in India already that's working on it and is a part of IPCC. But uh, it's just an area where I think the science has uh, has progressed a lot, but we still need to understand more uh, on, on local scale effects of the shifts due to the monsoon. The monsoon is a central source of livelihood for most of the region's people. 
So that's why that understanding the monsoon better and applying some of the U.S.'s own excellent resources and skills into that specific problem set would be, would be a greater help. Excellent. Thank you. I could under, if I could underscore uh, that, I, yeah. I think that's so important, Sarang, um, and I do think that could be part of the U.S.-India um, dialogue and engagement because uh, there's a lot more. We we have a lot of capability in the U.S. and and we should we should be able to share that constructively to do some scenario planning with India and other countries of the region about what happens with different future, you know, different possible futures of that monsoon cycle uh, and how that could affect the region, food and water security and livelihoods. Uh, yeah. Absolutely, I, I agree. Excellent, and another opportunity for that collaboration we were talking about before. Um, all right, I'm gonna jump to the questions in the Q&A and there's, there's a good question in here about how, do, how does political, ethnic and religious tension or conflict in areas where we see climate change effects, how does that hamper regional efforts at climate mitigation and planning? Or are there examples maybe where the scientific and humanitarian institutions have been able to avoid or overcome those, uh, those challenges? Thoughts on that question? I don't know, Sarang, do you have any thoughts in terms of South Asia? I know that's an issue. I mean, we, we identify as a climate security risk, frankly, <laughs> in and of itself. Yeah, yeah. There, there are tensions of different kinds that cross cut to the region. There are uh, long histories of post colonialism, post colonialism. There are histories of uh, sovereignty mm -hmm. uh, disputes and ethnicities, including religion, but also language and other cross cutting identities. So what usually happens is identity politics uh, often is a reflection when there are failures of other kinds, when there's uh, challenges of economic challenges or there are uh, governance failures, uh, they can translate more easily into ethnic or racial uh, tensions, inequality, things of that sort, which we indeed see also to an extent in the United States. So there is, it's a, it's a sensitive area of, of uh, enormous, that invokes a lot of emotion. And I think it's, um, it's just it's something we are seeing around the world, honestly, including, including South Asia. Yeah, Marcus? So, um, you know, not the first book that, I, that I'm writing right now on, um, the, that I've released recently in a water and conflict in the Middle East, but an upcoming work that I have is I've been looking at Nigeria, Syria, and Somalia mm. in terms of um, water stress and, and what some of the answers are there. And one thing that each case study has in common, of course, is ethnic divides, political divides, um, sectarian divides. Um, so I have been thinking a lot about the issue. Um, and, and so how does it act? You know, it, it acts as... Um, a threat multiplier or an instability accelerant in the sense that it exacerbates um, other underlying issues, which might be drought, which might be scarcities or, or food, um, you know, food, food scarcity. So it, it you know, the, the way that ethnic and religious politics act in the countries that I've seen is they, they sit on top of these other underlying trends of, of instability. Um, but then I think the real problem is what happens when one national government is seen as pandering to or actually belongs to one of these minorities, but not another, right? So if you look in Syria, it's the Alawite minority um, of Assad that, that um, you know, has the privileges. If you look at Nigeria, it might be the Hausa Fulani that have, um, you know, hold of the government at this point, but not another group, the clans in Somalia. Um, so it's a really tough issue and it's hard to know what the prescriptions are. But I think if you're not, if you're looking at it from a development standpoint, um, it's probably better to skip the national capitals in these countries, which are seen as already co-opted toward one of the um, interest groups and then move right onto the ground and, wor and work with the people there in that particular area to solve their particular problems um, and, and not um, at more at the national level, which could be, there could be actual corruption or 
there's at least the perception within the nation that the national government's unable to sort of fairly dispense the um, development assistance, for example. Sure, and I also think it's really important in those interventions um, to make sure that you have an understanding of those local dynamics so that you don't inadvertently in climate security interventions, right, exacerbate those tensions um, in some way by giving a group the upper hand in a way that's that's detrimental. Um, so having local partners is so, so critical there. Uh, I'm going to jump now. There's a question from John Conger, our colleague at the uh, Center for Climate and Security, asking about specific actions the State Department could take to address these near-term climate security risks. He asks, you know, what are the top three things the State Department should do to prepare, setting aside the carbon emissions question for now, because we all know that's the long-term piece of things. So uh, who would like to advise the State Department there on their top three priorities? Well, I, you know, I there was a beginnings of an effort uh, when Secretary Kerry was Secretary of State to integrate climate security into the policy planning process. Uh, and I, I think that's moving, you know, full steam ahead now uh, in this administration. I think that needs to be embraced and it needs to be also reflected uh, within all the regional bureaus within state historically. The power in state has been in the regional bureaus. And uh, while the functional bureaus are the ones that are addressing climate change, and particularly, you know, the office now that Secretary Kerry is the presidential envoy and has a whole staff, yes, they're leading on climate, but still you're going to have the assistant secretaries of state for Europe, Asia, Africa, you have all of those assistant secretaries, and they need to have a uh, the climate security of their region reflected in their policy, in their planning, um, regardless of whether they're dealing with, um, uh, you know, the Iran nuclear or North Korea or um, a whole variety of other trade or trade agreements, other sticky foreign policy issues. And also, I do think that the whole green transition now, the whole global move towards low carbon fuels is going to produce um, a whole set of unintended consequences that we haven't fully examined. Now, the Council on Strategic Risk has begun in its converging risk lab to look at some of those convergence of nuclear and climate risks. You know, what happens as we proliferate more nuclear power plants uh, for the beneficial use of having a zero carbon emission source? Um, what, are the, what are some of the uh, consequences of that? Either the climate consequences because they're in drought prone areas or the proliferation consequences because they're supplied by Russia or China uh, to areas that don't have good nuclear safety records. I mean, there are a variety of consequences. So I think all of that needs to um, be part of the state policy planning process and reflected in, in the work of the regional bureaus and the way they also request what, um, what well, was in the past called, uh, I don't know if I have the terminology right, but kind of that stabilization bureau uh, that grew out of the uh, efforts in, in um, of our presence in Iraq and Afghanistan, that all needs to be transformed now into something that looks at what stability really is in the climate era uh, and needs to be deeply reflected in that as we also, as will be reflected sort of how do we build democracy in an era of extremism, but all of these uh, interconnected, converging, and cascading risks need to be brought together in a meaningful way. Excellent. Yeah, Tegan. Each of us are contributing one, I think, so I'll contribute one here. Um, I really do think that we need to think more seriously about how we support regional institutions and help promote their work on these kinds of issues in given regions. Supporting regional institutions is something that is sometimes difficult for state and USAID because you have ambassadors who oversee the US relationship on a bilateral level. And we don't necessarily have a good place institutionally for regional support to regional entities to fit in well to just the way that the State Department and to some degree USAID are outlined. And so sometimes those critical partnerships with regional institutions fall through the cracks. 
But I truly do think that we should be prioritizing support for regional institutions more and more. Many of those have credibility in the regions in which they work. They have existing relationships with all levels of, or all kinds of different ministries and different um, people, different stakeholders within national governments. And they are in a position to help uh, really bring together the region around shared issues that are unique to that region rather than global issues, which may or may not be relevant in different regions. And so I would love to see more of an emphasis on support and partnership with regional institutions to lead on such critical issues in particular areas. Excellent point. And re, how do you rework the bureaucracy to match the actual needs of the moment on these on these issues? Uh, Saran? Yeah, so I would uh, uh, pick up on uh, uh, Tegan's point on regional organizations. In South Asia, they're quite weak. Uh, the main one, which is the South Asian Association of Regional Cooperation, is essentially not very active in the last several years, particularly. And there isn't really any, any regional organization uh, to tie South Asia with the increasingly important actor in South Asia, which is China. And uh, the Chinese presence is complex in many different levels. We don't probably have the time to discuss that sort of presentation by itself. But uh, it is interesting in that it, 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 it needs to be when the U.S. State Department looks at the region and with specifically the U.S.-China questions that are emerging front and center uh, at the moment, this becomes a, a kind of a, a, a triangle of sorts. Um, and in, in that triangle, climate change uh, can absolutely, and I think the Biden administration has said that itself many times, it, it's, a, it's a pathway of dialogue. Uh, it's a pathway where actually we can we can look to stabilize and reduce risk rather than other other areas of engagement which are going to be difficult and challenging by the nature of those areas. So, so I I would say yes. Uh, I think extra regional actors and indeed Russia was mentioned earlier. Russia is very active in the region in terms of nuclear power plants, which again are positive for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. But then. From the U.S. State Department standpoint, Russia presents certain challenges uh, as an actor. So, so squaring the circle is is very difficult. But uh, again, climate change presents areas where a dialogue is possible. Indeed, dialogue gets privileged over uh, over conflict in most cases. Just the nature of the topic is lends itself to more cooperation. Great, Marcus. Did you want to jump in with any advice to the State Department? <laughs> Well, I think from a diplomatic standpoint, we really, uh, you know, the State Department can lead in offering respect to the security agendas of countries that are more, that have, that have more um, stake in climate change impacts. Um, you know, even some of our, the developed countries like, um, re, you know, in Europe, you know, the Netherlands, they're actually a Caribbean nation. They, they have, um, you know, you know, integral parts of, of the Netherlands are, are in the Caribbean. Um, so for them, it's very real. It's a country that lies mostly under the sea, um, had severe floods in the 50s there. You know, so it's reassuring our allies that although the physical impacts of climate change might be less significant in the United States, that we still respect their, their security agenda. Um, so there has to be that messaging. And then, as I alluded to before, I think their climate finance is extremely important. So literally, um, I think the commitments that were made in 2014, um, we're at about 10% now globally of what those initial commitments were for the green um, climate fund and, and the adaptation fund. Um, so bringing more money into those, but also I think coming into Glasgow with a plan, you know, I, I know that the United States has rejoined the Paris Accord. Um, I'm not sure that we're ready to really sort of, you know, first put the money where our mouth is in terms of the, the financing that I just mentioned, but also I just don't know. I mean, are, are there any innovative ideas about how to advance the Paris Agreement 
um, that the United States has. I'm quite sure they're probably developing this at the White House level and at the State Department level, but it's very important to come into Glasgow with some solid ideas how to diplomatically advance the agreement. Yeah, excellent. Well, you know, this kind of leads into a couple of questions we have in the chat here around, you know, basically the legitimacy of the United States as a leader on these issues, given the swings in our domestic politics over the past few years. And what thoughts do we have on how, you know, is it really the executive branch the best place, uh, best position to lead on this given the changes? Um, how can the US lead humbly um, and come back to the world stage when we've lost some of our, our soft power on this? You know, what, what would you all recommend or how do you, how do you think about those issues? Okay, well, uh, I just on the on the personnel side, and it's a good question, because um, I think as we uh, staff up to address climate security and climate change and energy across the federal government, we need to do so um, not just with political appointees who, as the questioner notes, um, will be gone, uh, but we also need to develop deep uh, climate security expertise uh, at the um, at the career civil service and at the at the uniform level, so that means we we need to increase professional military education, improve professional military education in this area. Um, there have been some improvements in recent years, but there's a lot more to do. Um, we should be hiring more uh, climate uh, science and climate security expertise. Uh, across most of the combatant commands, the services. Uh, you know, last year, they, let's say the Air Force, uh, Air Force Weather was hiring its first dedicated climate scientist. So there are things like that where we need to hi hire and bring in people who will um, be embedded in our institutions, particularly our institutions of higher learning. Um, and that's, that's gonna be one important way um, to, ad to address this. And I think the same is going to be true for the other, for the federal agencies as well. Yeah, those are excellent points. And that would have been one of my recommendations for the State Department is building that um, scientific literacy amongst the entire uh, workforce and making sure that within embassies and country teams, you have folks that have climate expertise they can bring to the table. So it's not just always those separate offices that are coming in, but it's kind of ingrained in the, the system. Um, exactly. I'm going to actually, if you guys don't mind, since we're, you know, we've only got about 15 minutes left, we have a couple of good questions I want to get to. And if you want to jump back on this question, others can. There's a good question about the Global Fragility Act in particular. And if we can talk a little bit more about what that can and should do on climate security and how should DOD relate to that act relative to U.S. aid and, and state. And Tegan, I might ask you to jump in on that one if you wouldn't mind. I know you're thinking about these issues? Yes. Um, I'm not sure I have a good response to that, though. I mean, I think that the, the Global Fragility Act is a really wonderful opportunity to integrate climate risks into our response to fragility. But in a sense, we also need to be thinking about security risks in our climate change work, which has been the topic of a lot of the discussion here today. And so thinking about how both of those directions inform the other and what are some of the commonalities and how we think about that work, what are some of the cultural shifts that we have to make as communities of technical people who work on these different issues and try to collaborate further. I just think that there's a lot of learning that we have to do to go both ways. And so the GFA potentially provides an incredible platform to really highlight and begin that work, but it is not unique to the GFA platform and is something that we need to be doing better in many different arenas. So I want to just add, because uh, Josh, that was a, Josh Busby asked that question. He's a, a climate, uh, deep expertise in this field and uh, thank you for all your work over the years and um, I think on this I see in the, that she's on this Annalise Blum um, at DOD led the effort to establish recess which is a, a DOD and sort of semi-interagency group uh, resource 
competition, environmental security, and stabilization formed initially to help organize understanding climate security risks for the Global Fragility Act. So I'm sure Annalise can provide you the, the detailed uh, summary of how they integrated there, but I think that it's very important that in these broader uh, global fragility and other um, efforts that don't necessarily say climate, the climate consideration is considered on a whole of government basis. Good. Uh, Marcus or Sarang, did you want to jump in on that one or? No? Okay. Uh, the next question here, I think is actually a really, really interesting one as well. And one we've touched on, but I want to explore a little bit more is, you know, the challenge of climate change for the developing world seems wider in scope than USAID or state or even DOD. How do we increase agency to agency capacity building, you know, from US quote unquote domestic agencies, National Weather Service, NOAA, USDA, to directly engage their counterparts in developing countries on these, these issues? Thoughts on that? I would say a lot of that actually already exists. Um, mm. I mean, I, I've I've seen this from my my time at, at uh, you know at Ocean Leadership. We had a, a there are a lot of international scientific cooperations on uh, ocean science, climate science, meteorology, food mm -hmm. and agriculture. I mean, it exists. I think the missing link sometimes is that the connection between the scientific research and the security implications mm -hmm. and the operational implications. Uh, and, and the scientists are off here doing their thing, internet, you know, connected between NSF funded work and their counterparts and international organizations. And then the security people are over here. So that's the connection I think that um, can better be, in, better be improved. And I think is inherent in what the uh, president's executive order asked for in climate risk analysis, because it does require us to integrate um, the science uh, with the security planning. Mm -hmm. But if I, if I add the floor, I'm just going to answer that sure. last question on there on edge as long as we're talking education. Yes, please. PME uh, institutes such as NDU and others should have more than just an occasional elective course. They should thread this not, they should have uh, uh, elective courses. And I've seen some good ones emerging now at the Naval War College in particular has got some dedicated faculty. Uh, we all know uh, Ken Butts who was at the Army War College for many years. He was really leading in this area and, and uh, also um, uh, Kristen Fletcher at uh, Naval Postgraduate School, uh, and, there, and there are others, um, but I think we need to have it across the board at our PME institutions, and it needs to be not just an elective, but integrated uh, throughout the curriculum at various levels of, of training, uh, not just kind of the classes at the 06 to cap go to, but all throughout the curriculum, and that would include, uh, someone asked a question about IMET, uh, that would include in the International Military Education Program when we bring the foreign officers over to the U.S., uh, but also in courses that we offer. And, and I think there's also been a question raised about should we have, let's say, in some of our regional security organizations like NATO, should we have a climate security center of excellence? Now, that's a good question to think about now. Uh, there is an energy, I think, energy or and maybe a disaster risk reduction center of excellence. So good question to ask now. Is it time for something more dedicated on climate security? Yeah, excellent. Thanks for jumping in on that question, Sherry. Um, I did want to get to a question that we have in here about um, to go a little deeper on the, the climate uh, migration issue. And, you know, acknowledging, John Conger says, acknowledging that migration is a manifestation of climate adaptation and not a threat in and of itself, right? Migration is often a positive adaptation response. What are, what are steps the U.S. could take to help the global community prepare for an order of magnitude increase in migration, climate migration in coming years, and ensure the safety and security of those people who are dislodged by climate disruptions? I know you touched on this a bit in your remarks, Marcus, but are there other thoughts folks have on how to manage this uh, issue going forward? Maybe I, I can add a couple of points there. Uh, so yeah, I think in, in South Asia and in fact, 
all of the global south, it says it's an ongoing, even without climate change, there is a migration challenge. Because simply, for example, in South Asia, there's been migration to cities accelerating over the last two or three decades. Just because urban areas is just more attractive and agriculture has been suffering as, as a livelihood means for most people. So there's a dual dynamic happening. And then you add to that the layer of climate change and you spin that forward by 20 or 30 years and you, you really get a very serious, potentially very serious situation. Again, emphasizing, I think John Comer's excellent point that it's not the migrants that are uh, the threat, but say they are responding as anybody would to a challenge that they didn't usually, in almost all cases, create. But it, it is how that feeds into the overall governance and political uh, responses. So I think there are two ends of it. One is the supply end of migration, which is a, a driver, which is through climate change, but also through the crisis of agriculture in the region that has many causes. And the other side is the, the destination end, which is the cities. And that's again takes me back to that excellent point, the urban uh, planning that was made, uh, I think, by Dr. King, uh, about uh, really thinking of how South Asian cities are, are going to develop, or indeed cities in Africa, or Latin America too, going to develop down the road in terms of how they're planned and how they are, how space is imagined, how transport is imagined. Because if they're reproductions of some of the experiences of the US in the 1950s or 60s, that obviously may not be the most sustainable pathway. And, um, and I think there is, in, in many global Southern countries, there is an idealization and the, the role models they have are role models that in fact, the US and Europe itself are moving away from, which are from the past. And so it, it's, an, it's, a, it's a whole, it's a question that touches upon norms and, and ideas and aspirations as much as it touches upon, you know, the physical variables of climate change and, and, and governance and so forth. So. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, and thanks for the reminder too that that usually that first step of climate migration is internal and often from rural to to urban, as Hagen mentioned at the very beginning. Um, other, I other just thoughts? want to add a yep, per please. personal point here because I, I'm the daughter of Holocaust refugees, and I, I just feel this very deeply and personally. Like, there's no doubt, okay, that migration policy failed in World War II, right? And it contributed to 6 million and more dying. Now, obviously it wasn't all about migration policy, but we know now, we know enough to know that you know global migration is at its greatest point since World War II um, and that we haven't done enough to address it. And uh, Marcus made some good points about uh, re -engage, the US re-engaging more substantively now in um, migration planning um, and policies through the UN. Uh, obviously we hadn't been doing very much in the UN uh, in the last couple of years, but now we can uh, more deeply be engaged and, and uh, in, involve ourselves in reshaping um, a, a climate refugee and migration um, policy and practice that fits the needs of the, of the modern era. And I think we have to be mindful that when presenting these issues in the US context uh, where um, borders are often the, uh, you know, part of a whole part of the issue that um, it's not only, we, we not only rely on sort of the humanitarian and, and need that, that very much exists, but also, um, but also our, national, our own national interest uh, and I think that has to be uh, that has to be part of it because we increasingly see China offering itself as the humanitarian assistance and natural you know disaster relief provider, a first resort in in many regions, and increasingly so, and um, presenting themselves as attractive uh, investment. Uh, and trading and relief provider. And we, you know, part of uh, having a humane migration policy will serve our own national interest well as uh, we as we are in this era of um, 
a strategic competition with China. Thanks, Sherry. Any other thoughts on this? Otherwise, we've got about five minutes left, and I did want to give all the speakers one last word if they would like on, on this topic going forward. So maybe we can just do a quick go around for final final thoughts, and I'll start with you, Tegan, <laughs> to put you on the spot. <laughs> Both the bane and the advantage of having a name at the beginning of the yes. alphabet, right? <laughs> You know, overall, I would just say how it's been really wonderful to hear what the other participants had to say, and I really appreciate everybody's contributions, plus the, the questions coming in from the audience. I think we're struggling with a very tough field. It is, it raises huge issues. They are not easily tractable. And we need to move forward thoughtfully and, as we have discussed several times, with a bit of humbleness, more than a bit of humbleness, in how we partner with countries around the world. And I would emphasize that partnership. That partnership is absolutely critical, that we act uh, you know, wholeheartedly to engage people where they are, where we are, to learn both ways and to move together as partners. That to me is a vision that is absolutely critical to us being able to effectively engage in the Paris Agreement and discussions going forward there, but also to have any impact on such challenging issues related to climate and security going forward. Thank you. Uh, Marcus, you're next in my screen here, so I'll go to you. But, but not alphabetically. Um, no, no, I know. I'm, I'm changing things up. I'm keeping you on your toes. <laughs> I have what um, I, I usually present as really good news. Um, and this is a framework that um, Frank Femi and Caitlin Worrell have um, introduced through a lot of their work in writing in the Center for Climate and Security, um, which is the responsibility to prepare for and to prevent the worst impacts of climate change. And um, luckily, you know, we do have that capacity, especially in northern nations at this point, um, in terms of the capacities resident in science um, and earth observation platforms, um, predictive capability, you know, so along with these, this capacity comes the responsibility um, to, to address the worst impacts. And so I think we can do that. We're on the precipice of being able to help countries uh, and so I think now there, you know, we just have to look at the opportunities to do so and implement those. Excellent. Thank you. Sarang? I just uh, maybe say that uh, pick up from where the Biden administration has coined this term, whole of government approach to climate change. And I think it's so uh, evocative because when you translate that to the global plane, to me, that becomes the whole of global governance approach to climate change. So, and not just in formal institutions, because we are moving increasingly to a world of informal clubs and groups, whether it's on mitigation, whether it's uh, groups like the Quad in Asia, uh, whether it's other uh, groups in the UN, such as the Friends of uh, Climate and Security. So these are informal groups. The advantage of those groups is that they uh, are flexible, and potentially open and taking advantage of not only the formal organizations of governance, but also the informal coalitions and cross-cutting nature of what is a cross-cutting problem. Uh, so why should it be, be a surprise that cross-cutting solutions are emerging and it's a perfect timing for that. So just how do we rethink global governance with climate change as a lens is a, is a massive task and uh, opportunity for all of us to uh, think and think about and analyze and propose solutions. Thank you. All right, Sherry, over to you. OK, thank you. Uh, and thanks to all the panelists and uh, to so many of the questioners, because so many of you are um, also climate security experts in your own right and could well be um, on this panel. So building on the framework of uh, responsibility to prepare, um, which I wholeheartedly agree uh, and endorse, which grew out of an effort, the, the earlier framework on responsibility to prevent uh, mass atrocities, 
Um, and then it made me think back to kind of the first era of environmental security in the 1990s, during which time we had a defense concept called preventive defense in the early post-Cold War period, where we were focused on building democracy, trust, and understanding. And many of those concepts, um, trust, uh, understanding, uh, promoting democracy, particularly in an era of um, extremism, uh, leads us to think about sort of an environmental security 2.0 concept that is more focused towards, um, in some ways, th this preparation is about peace building in a way that we haven't always thought about it in, in the past. And some of the elements of that are a much more human-centric approach. We talk about human security now, not only the states. The underscore Tegan and others points about you know, returning to the table, the US with humility, uh, being humble. Um, and I think that's very, very important uh, in an inclusive approach that uh, recognizes a variety of facets of environmental and racial justice and a just transition that all need to be accounted for as we move towards uh, a decarbonized uh, future and a better world for all. Thank you so much, Sherry, and thanks to all of the panelists today and all of our audience members. You had excellent questions. A mark for me of whether a panel is successful is if I learn something or I'm going to think about something in a different way going forward, and that definitely happened in this conversation today. So uh, thanks again, and we look forward to seeing you on the CCS Twitter feed or the website and to continue the, the conversation going forward. So have a good afternoon, everybody, and take care. Thank you all. Thanks. Thank you.